Preface, Introduction, and Epistle Dedicatory of the Characters of Theophrastus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. The Characters of Theophrastus by Theophrastus. Preface, Introduction, and Epistle Dedicatory. Preface this translation of the characters of theophrastus is intended not for the narrow circle of classical philologists but for the larger body of cultivated persons who have an interest in the past within the last century only three english translations of the characters have appeared one by howell london eighteen twenty four another by isaac taylor london eighteen thirty six the third by professor jebb london eighteen seventy all of these have long been out of print a fact that seemed to justify the preparation of the present work the text followed has been in the main that of the edition published in eighteen ninety seven by the leipziger philologische gesellschaft a few coarse passages have been omitted and occasionally a phrase necessary to the understanding of the context has been inserted apart from this the translators have aimed to render the original with as much precision and fidelity as is consistent with english idiom charles e bennett william a hammond ithaca new york august nineteen o two introduction what stories are new asked thackeray subtle observer of men all types of all characters march through all fables tremblers and boasters victims and bullies dupes and knaves long-eared neddies giving themselves leonine airs tartuffes wearing virtuous clothing lovers and their trials their blindness their folly and constancy with the very first page of the human story do not love and lies too begin so the tales were told ages before aesop and asses under lion's manes roared in hebrew and sly foxes flattered in etruscan and wolves in sheep clothing gnashed their teeth in sanskrit no doubt the sun shines to-day as he did when he first began shining and the birds in the tree overhead while i am writing sing very much the same note they have sung ever since there were finches there may be nothing new under and including the sun but it looks fresh every morning and we rise with it to toil hope scheme laugh struggle love suffer until the night comes and quiet and then will wake morrow and the eyes that look upon it and so de capo all this is very true the changes which may be observed in human nature are small and the old types of theophrastus are all about us nowadays and really look and act much the same as they did to the eyes of the ancient peripatetic offices and institutions have somewhat changed and many character types due to new vocations have come into being since then e g the newsboy the bishop the reporter the hotel clerk and the jockey but these are only accidents of civilization and the peculiarities of office or the type or professional character do not touch the vital essence of human nature although they may modify its expression when one speaks of a coward one means an intrinsic quality in humankind which is essentially the same whether found in a hoplite or in a modern infantryman but which may express itself differently in the two cases the types described by theophrastus are types of such intrinsic qualities and his pictures of ancient vices and weaknesses show men much as we see them now they are not merely types of professions or callings apart from slight variations of local colouring and institutions the descriptions of the old greek philosopher might apply almost as well to the present inhabitants of london or boston as to the athenians of three hundred b c then as now the flatterer plied his wily trade indulging in smooth compliment of his hero's person or actions as he walks with an acquaintance he says behold how the eyes of all men are turned upon you there is not a man in the city who enjoys so much notice as yourself yesterday your praises were the talk of the porch while above thirty men were sitting there together and the conversation fell upon the topic who is our noblest citizen they all began and ended with your name 
if his friend essay a jest the flatterer laughs and stuffs his sleeve into his mouth as though he could not contain himself but the flatterer of old could be subtle too he buys apples and pears carries them to his hero's house and gives them to the children and in the presence of their father he kisses them exclaiming chips of the old block and while his talk is directed to others in the company his eye is ever fixed upon his hero then as now there existed the officious man always over ready to undertake the impossible or to interfere in the affairs of others at a banquet he forces the servants to mix more wine than the guests can drink if he sees two men in a quarrel he rushes in between even though he knows neither one if the doctor leaves instructions that no wine be given the patient he administers oh, just a little on the plea that he wants to set the sufferer right there existed of course then as now the tactless person who selects a man's busiest hour for a lengthy conference and who sings love ditties under his sweetheart's window as she lies ill of a fever at a wedding he declaims against womankind and when a friend has just finished a journey he invites him to go for a walk if he happens to be standing by when a slave is flogged he tells the story of how he once flogged a slave of his who then went and hanged himself there was the mean man too who if his servant broke a pot or plate deducted its value from the poor fellow's rations he permits no one to take a fig from his garden or cross his field or even to pick up windfalls under his fruit trees he forbids his wife to lend salt or lamp wicks or a pinch of cumin marjoram or meal observing that these trifles make a large sum in a year there was also the thankless man whose pessimism is so gloomy as to cloud all view of his blessings when a friend has sent him something from his table he says to the servant who brings it he grudged me a dish of soup and a cup of wine i suppose and so couldn't invite me to dinner if he secures a slave at a bargain after long dickerings with the owner he says i imagine i haven't got much at this price and to the person who brings him glad tidings that a son is born to him he retorts if you only add and half your fortune's gone you'll hit it then we have the man who is ostentatious in trivial things when he has sacrificed an ox he winds up the head and horns with fillets and nails them up opposite the entrance of his house when he parades with the cavalry he gives all his accoutrement to his squire to carry home and throwing back his mantle stalks proudly about the market-place in his spurs when he is master of the prytany he craves the privilege of announcing to the people the result of the sacrifice and as soon as he has delivered to the people the momentous intelligence that the sacrifice has resulted well he hies him home and recounts his triumph to his wife in an ecstasy of joy the foregoing are but illustrations of the happy skill with which theophrastus has delineated a number of character types which are as universal as human nature and know no limits of age or of country here and there we meet a type in the greek for which we have no exact counterpart in our customary modern modes of thought such a type may be seen in theophrastus the disagreeable man a person who seems a sort of general nuisance with a touch of the boar and the braggart as a rule however the types are singularly like those we know to-day and it is not difficult at once to provide them with appropriate modern labels the treatment though almost invariably brief is invariably vigorous and trenchant with a few bold strokes the character is drawn there is absolutely no pretense of style as we ordinarily understand it yet each type is in its way a gem through them all runs that fidelity to truth which was the unfailing inspiration of all greek art it is this which makes the characters a unique creation and vindicates their position as a part of the world's literature it is largely for this reason that these slight sketches are here produced in english exhibiting as they do when we compare them with what we see around us the essential identity of human nature in ages widely separated from each other in time and manners there is furthermore an accidental interest in the work of theophrastus 
due to the fact that it is the first recorded attempt at systematic character writing characters to be sure are portrayed in homer and in the tragedians but they are incidental to the narrative or to the dramatic plot whereas in theophrastus the business is with the delineation of a character as such he tells us what a man does simply as an illustration of what he is and this method of writing had a very intimate bearing on the evolution of the new comedy under the leadership of menander there is a tradition in fact that theophrastus was the teacher of menander who in turn furnished models for terence in his delineation of conventional dramatic types the influence of theophrastus was further directly and potently exerted on the so-called character writers of the seventeenth century in england and france the simple methods of these character writers and their uninvolved sketches were succeeded by the more elaborate art of the novelists in whose works individuals rather than types are described by exhibiting their development in long periods of time and under great diversity of circumstances we have little information as to the personal history of theophrastus beyond what we learn from the extant fragments of his writings and from the meagre biography of diogenes of laertes he was born at eresus a village on the island of lesbos in three seventy one b c and his father was one melantas a fuller by trade he first went to school to alcippus in his native island but afterwards travelled to athens the intellectual metropolis and became a pupil of plato at the academy with whom he appears to have studied until the master's death theophrastus was then in his twenty-fifth year at that time he attached himself to aristotle who was some twelve years his senior and who had also been a member of the academy until plato died scrivens during the twelve years which elapsed from the death of plato until aristotle established the new school of the lyceum in three thirty five b c theophrastus was probably with his new leader at least part of the time in stagira or at the macedonian court where the youthful alexander was under the tutorial discipline of aristotle theophrastus was an intimate friend of callisthenes the unfortunate fellow-student and companion of alexander and it is probable that the two studied together at pella the story is told that aristotle in speaking of these two pupils said callisthenes needs a spur but theophrastus a bridle many years later when aristotle was dead and cassander see character seven had gained control of alexander's throne theophrastus was invited to an office at the court where he had spent his student days and ptolemy soter cassander's political ally sent him an invitation to the court of egypt but he declined these calls into the social and political world and maintained steadfastly his devotion to philosophy it was a fashion for the rectors or presidents of the great schools of athens such as the cynosarges the academy and the lyceum before their death to name their successors in office and so when aristotle was asked who should succeed him in the presidency of the lyceum tradition tells of the delicate way in which he left record of his wish his two most distinguished pupils were theophrastus of lesbos and eudemus of rhodes aristotle replied to the question as to his successor by asking for two sorts of wine lesbian and rhodian after tasting of them he said they are both excellent but the lesbian is the sweeter thereby it was known that he had decided in favour of theophrastus who on the death of aristotle three twenty two b c succeeded to the presidency of the lyceum over which he continued to preside for thirty-five years his administration was one of almost unparalleled success diogenes laertius reports that two thousand students thronged to him although not born at athens he was one of the most popular and beloved members of that somewhat exclusive community this is illustrated by the story of agonides who preferred against him a charge of atheism a charge similar to that which brought socrates to martyrdom and drove aristotle into exile and caused his early death but instead of injuring theophrastus agonides narrowly escaped paying a fine for his folly 
amongst his contemporaries theophrastus was a great personal force by reason of his amiable character his charities and lavish benefactions the amenity of his manners his great erudition and gifts of oratory he died in 287 B.C. in the 85th year of his age, and Diogenes Laertius says that the whole population of Athens, honoring him greatly, followed him to the grave. Theophrastus was one of the greatest polygraphs of antiquity. Two hundred and twenty-seven works are attributed to him. The range of his learning is similar to that of Aristotle's and with the emphasis laid rather more strongly on the side of natural science. His genius, however, is not marked by Aristotle's profundity. He served his age rather as a great popularizer of science. He was not an originator of epoch-making ideas or theories. Yet, as a local and popular force, he surpassed Aristotle. His influence on subsequent ages, however, is less marked. Of the 227 works, containing 232,908 lines attributed to Theophrastus, fragments of nine only are now extant, excluding certain insignificant remains. It is doubtless true, however, that he influenced his own time as much by his administrative ability in the conduct of the Lyceum and by his oral utterances as by his written treatises his prodigious industry was no doubt partially inspired by aristotle as well as by the swift stirring movement of the age immediately preceding and following the death of alexander in which his literary manhood was passed time he says is the most valuable thing a man can spend he expressed his sense of the value of order in the apothem better trust a horse without bridle than a discourse without arrangement his estimate of oral converse at table is recorded in a rather brusque and unathenian remark said to have been made by him to a silent neighbor at dinner sir if you are an ignorant man your conduct shows wisdom but if you are a wise man you act like a fool the genuinely kind character of theophrastus however is amply illustrated by the provisions of his will which evidences also his very considerable wealth he had inherited from aristotle the largest private library then known this library to which he had himself made notable additions he bequeathed to neleus his nephew theophrastus never married and by neleus it was taken to asia minor where it was hidden in a cellar to avoid the rapacity of the agents of the attalid dynasty who were seizing all available books for the royal library at pergamon and hereby hangs the curious old story of the loss of aristotle's works for one hundred and fifty years until they were rediscovered worm-eaten in the cellar of neleus at skepsis a museum temple of the muses had been built by theophrastus as the home of the lyceum in his will he provided that this should be maintained and beautified that statues of the illustrious dead particularly of aristotle should be completed for which commissions had already been given to the renowned sculptor praxiteles further that tablets with maps of the world engraved on them should be erected in the lower colonnade in acknowledgment of the claims of religion he also directed that an altar should be placed there he devised the garden, promenade, and houses adjoining the garden to the joint control of Hipparchus, Neleus, Strato, and their successors as a trust, enjoining that a school of philosophy should be maintained in them, and that the property should never be alienated from this purpose, nor claimed as private possession. After piously making provision for certain friends and the support of faithful attendants, he further directed that he should be buried in the school garden without unnecessary expense or ceremony. Theophrastus is more generally known for his character sketches than for his scientific work, although his treatises on botany represented the highest attainments made by science in that field during antiquity and the Middle Ages 
the treatise here translated sets forth thirty types of character striking to the greek mind they are probably a fragment or extract made by some epitomator from a larger treatise which was suggested by the abstract ethical analyses of aristotle as exhibited in the nicomachean ethics and by the concrete dramatic representations of the new comedy the stage suggests the form and aristotle's treatise the content they represent moral and social defects and weaknesses though not revolting vices but they do this in a mimetic way by exhibiting persons as acting or speaking theophrastus was a contemporary of philemon and menander and his life was spent in the era of the revival of comedy and the elaboration of current moral types for humorous presentation on the stage so the characters of theophrastus are as it were dramatis personae of his time he shows us how a given type of man speaks and acts the dramatization of his characters would require scarcely anything more than stage setting his portrayal is not satire but imitation not caricature but realistic delineation from life moreover this description of generic types rather than of individuals belongs to the literary fashion of his age looked at from this mimetic point of view the characters of theophrastus are historically all the more important because our knowledge of menander the tenth muse is so meagre resting as it does upon scanty greek fragments and a few latin adaptations these thirty sketches at the beginning of the post-classical age do not represent properly speaking vices and yet they were vices to the mind of the greek who measured his morality largely by the canons of good form any violation of good taste or breach of courtesy was morally vicious the disposition was to maintain in close unity the natures of beauty and goodness moderns discriminate sharply between the aesthetic and the moral the social virtues of gentle breeding and the graces of politeness toward their fellow men had for the classical greeks an ethical nature as is witnessed in aristotle's ethics manners and morals were not sundered what we call a social weakness or defect or boorish crudity theophrastus called a vice it is necessary to bear this in mind when one reads the moral characters as they are called in the greek title amongst these characters there are no virtues and one may ask why is it that in his portrayal of types theophrastus has altogether omitted any description of good men the answer is not to be found in the supposition that such characters were originally included in the work but have since perished the real ground for the omission is probably to be discovered in the nature of the conditions under which theophrastus wrote these as we have already indicated were closely connected with the development of the new comedy the portrayal of a good character may be edifying and may serve the conditions of tragedy but it does not suit the purposes or surroundings of the comic stage where the ludicrous elements of weak eccentric or faulty personalities are the materials employed the aim of theophrastus is both to amuse and to instruct but his instruction is given by exposing to ridicule certain faults which he elevates into the striking tangibility of concrete character the serious dignity and excellence of the good man while it may suit the heroic conditions of the epic the grave purpose of tragedy or the aims of moral allegory offers no material for such sketches as these theophrastus has no concern either with the grossly immoral or with the helplessly weak the former awaken only disgust and hate while the latter stir only feelings of pity and neither of these emotions can be kept active in the true art of comedy rightly speaking the art of theophrastus has to do only with folly or with such eccentricities and weaknesses as have a humorous aspect and it is only moral imperfections of this sort that we actually find in the characters as to the serious function of instruction which theophrastus no doubt aims to combine with that of entertainment there is no more skilful mode of inducing moral betterment than the discovery and exposure of the ludicrous 
most men would rather incur the charge of immorality than be exposed to the belittling laugh or derision of a community they would rather be rogues than fools the portrait painter of moral life makes use of the ludicrous when he desires to catch the popular attention and there is nothing one may safely say that makes society at large prick up its ears and fall to gossiping so much as a satire in which some well-known person is subjected to ridicule moral folly is much the same everywhere it is only the fool's costume that changes in different countries the folly of the miser is seen in his cheating himself of the real goods of life and in robbing himself of the respect of his fellows the folly of the coward in gaining personal safety by losing reputation for manliness the folly of the flatterer in his shallow self-serving which men see through while they nudge their fellows and laugh at his weakness the folly of the vain man in the way in which he assumes impressive proportions to his own magnifying eye while to others his personality looks as small as it is the folly of the tactless man in consulting his own convenience rather than his neighbours whereby he becomes a butt for his gaucherie the folly of the boor in his trampling awkwardly on the established usages of the polite world and thereby drawing upon himself the smilingly derisive attention of all observers throughout the list these characters represent some type of social foible or folly in regard to the literary art of theophrastus as exhibited in these sketches it must be looked at from the standpoint of an innovation in greek letters it is rare that any man both begins and perfects an art there is nothing in the world so interesting as a character but there is also nothing that is so difficult to portray briefly theophrastus was an acute observer and he was a plain realist his art consists in the truthfulness of his vision and in the direct simplicity with which he gives it expression he does not seek to create a laugh by exaggeration or by the trick of a ludicrous situation that has no moral significance his art is not possible without wit keenness and fineness of feeling there is no exhibition of the satirist's lash but his criticism is made with that geniality which is more telling than the severest invective these are not individual portraits they lack therefore the detailed finish of such a portrait as is given in the much elaborated modern novel with its varied facilities for exhibiting the individuality of one or several persons on the contrary these are merely outline sketches as theophrastus himself calls them and are descriptive of a class not of an individual a simple line however does not constitute a sketch to exhibit a character the sketch must not only be clear but complete the coward e g is sketched in his fear at sea where his timid imagination invents dangers and he wishes to be put ashore he is sketched on the field of battle where he tries to impress his comrades by a courage that he does not feel but when he hears the shouts of war and sees the soldiers fall he shrinks faint-hearted to his tent and there searches for the sword he has himself hid and again when the danger is over he resumes his bold exterior and proclaims his daring rescue of a comrade we have here a pictorial sketch which with its life and action appeals to the reader's eye the coward is shown from various points of view always in new lights but he is always the coward the canons of this species of literary art may be summarized as follows one faithfulness to reality the character must be an accurate report of nature and not a caricature it must be executed in the spirit of realism two brevity it must be slight and swift essentially of the nature of a sketch three humor it must have the sprightliness of statement that amuses while it instructs four type it must be illustrative of a generic or typical fault in other words the character must give embodiment to some fault that touches human nature in an essential and universal way five concreteness the fault as an abstraction must be translated by the artist's power into a concrete personal form 
the foible must be revealed in a genre picture of a living personality since theophrastus this form of character writing has been cultivated at various times but it flourished most amongst the minor essayists of the seventeenth century it is of too slight a nature in itself to make a serious impression on any literary epoch it suited however the temper of the seventeenth century as the sprightly essay possessing no serious depth and aiming to touch life at many points the chief imitators of theophrastus and exponents of character writing at this time were bishop hall bishop earl sir thomas overbury nicholas breton samuel butler and la bruyere bishop hall contrary to the example of theophrastus includes virtues as well as vices in his book entitled characters of virtues and vices london sixteen o eight in the general structure of his composition he follows the model of theophrastus closely in the description of vices however he is much more entertaining than in his sketches of virtues which are rather homilies and as the panegyrics of a tedious preacher provoke one to yawn virtue is not fitting material for this species of writing the brilliant but ill-starred sir thomas overbury in his characters or witty descriptions of the properties of sundry persons london sixteen fourteen went through eighteen editions departs from the usage of theophrastus in depicting for the most part amusing accidents of character and humorous peculiarities of trades and professions bishop earl on the other hand in his microcosmography london sixteen twenty eight confined his character delineation to mores hominum to ethical types of men as such in a spirit similar to that of his greek model the best known of all the imitators of theophrastus if he can be called an imitator at all is la bruyere in his les caractères ou les meuses de la siècle paris sixteen eighty eight the characters of la bruyere are really satires on certain thinly disguised contemporaries of his own and are executed in a spirited method totally different from that of theophrastus but to which a translation of the characters of theophrastus is added la bruyere was a lover of the ancient classics although his translation or paraphrase was hardly more than a pretext for writing down his own description of the manners of his time it furnished him perhaps the first suggestion and the first impulse to the portrayal of the vices and weaknesses of his contemporaries on a much larger scale than theophrastus had attempted epistle dedicatory theophrastus to polycles many a time ere now i have stopped to think and wonder i fancy the marvel will never grow less why it is that we greeks are not all one in character for we have the same climate throughout the country and our people enjoy the same education i have studied human nature a long time my dear polythes for i have lived nine and ninety years i have conversed with many men of diverse characters and have been at great pains to observe both good and bad i have fancied therefore i ought to set down in writing how men live and act i shall describe their characters each after its kind and show you their besetting weaknesses i dare say polycles our children will be the better if we leave them memorials of this sort and as they study these patterns of good and ill they will elect i think to live and hold communion with men of the highest type in this way they will strive to maintain the level of the highest i turn now to my task yours it is to follow me and see if what i say is true i begin my book with a description of the dissembler omitting any preface and details about the word and first of all i shall lay down a definition of dissembling and with this in view shall describe the dissembler in his character and manner of life exhibiting in such clearness as i can his various traits End of a Preface and Introductory Material Part 1 of The Characters of Theophrastus by Theophrastus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1 1. The Dissembler 
dissembling generally speaking is an affectation whether in word or action intended to make things seem other than they really are the dissembler is a man for instance who accosts his enemies and engages readily in talk with them to show that he bears no grudge and who praises to their faces the very men he slanders behind their backs and when these lose a suit at court he professes sympathy for their misfortune when men malign him or the opposition is loud he is ever ready with forgiveness when others have suffered such ill-treatment as to have just cause for indignation his comments on their wrongs are couched in non-committal terms and when a man is anxious to have an interview with him he bids him come again pretending that he has just reached home that the hour is late or that his health is too feeble to bear the strain he never admits anything he is doing but at most will say that he is considering it when a friend would borrow of him or would solicit his contribution he says uh, business is dreadfully dull though at other times when business is really dull he reports a thriving trade if he has received a bit of news he will not admit he has heard it and when he has witnessed an occurrence he will not admit he has seen it or if he does admit it he protests he can't recall it and of one matter he says he will examine it of another that he doesn't know of others that he is amazed of yet others that he had thought of that himself before in short he is a master of phrases like these oh, i can't believe it i fail to comprehend i'm dumbfounded by your account the fellow has become a different man he certainly didn't tell me that the thing's improbable tell that to the marines i'm at a loss how i can either doubt your story or condemn my friend but see whether you're not too credulous two the flatterer flattery is a cringing sort of conduct that aims to promote the advantage of the flatterer the flatterer is the kind of man who as he walks with an acquaintance says behold how the people gaze at you there is not a man in the city who enjoys so much notice as yourself yesterday your praises were the talk of the porch while above thirty men were sitting there together and the conversation fell upon the topic who is our noblest citizen they all began and ended with your name as the flatterer goes on talking in this strain he picks a speck of lint from his hero's cloak or if the wind has lodged a bit of straw in his locks he plucks it off and says laughingly see you because i have not been with you these two days your beard is turning gray and yet if any man has a beard that is black for his years it is you while his patron speaks he bids the rest be silent he sounds his praises in his hearing and after the patron's speech gives the cue for applause by bravo if the patron makes a stale jest the flatterer laughs and stuffs his sleeve into his mouth as though he could not contain himself if they meet people on the street he asks them to wait until master passes he buys apples and pears carries them to his hero's house and gives them to the children and in the presence of the father who is looking on he kisses them exclaiming bends of a worthy sire when the patron buys a pair of shoes the flatterer observes the foot is of a finer pattern than the boot if he calls on a friend the flatterer trips on ahead and says you are to have the honor of his visit and then turns back with i have announced you of course he can run and do the errands at the market in a twinkle amongst guests at a banquet he is the first to praise the wine and doing it ample justice he observes what a fine cuisine you have he takes a bit from the board and exclaims what a dainty morsel this is then he inquires whether his friend is chilly asks if he would like a wrap put over his shoulders and whether he shall throw one about him with these words he bends over and whispers in his ear while his talk is directed to the rest his eye is fixed on his patron in the theatre he takes the cushions from the page and himself adjusts them for the comfort of the master of his hero's house he says it is well built of his farm it is well tilled and of his portrait it's a speaking image three the coward cowardice is a certain shrinking of the heart 
a coward is a man who as he sails along imagines that the cliffs in the distance are pirate ships if the waves are high he asks if there's anybody in the ship's company who has not been initiated into the mysteries he bends over toward the helmsman and inquires whether he intends to keep to the high seas and what he thinks of the weather and to his companion says that he is in terror in consequence of a dream he has had and he takes off his tunic and gives it to his slave and begs to be set on shore in a campaign when the infantry march forth he bids his comrades stand by him and look sharp urging the importance of finding out whether yonder object be the foe or not when he hears the sound of battle and sees men fall he says to those about him that in his haste he has forgotten to take his sword then he runs back to his tent sends his servant out and bids him see where the enemy are meanwhile he hides his weapon under his pillow and then waits a long time hunting for it while in his tent seeing one of his companions brought wounded from the field he runs out bids the fellow cheer up and lends a hand to carry the stretcher and then he stays to tend the sufferer washes his wounds and sits by his side driving away the flies anything but fight the enemy when the trumpeter sounds the signal for a fresh onset he exclaims as he sits in his tent plague take him he won't let the poor fellow get to sleep with his eternal bugling then staining himself with blood from the other's wound he meets the troops as they return from battle and pretending to have been in the thick of the fight he exclaims i've saved a comrade and then he takes his demsmen and tribesmen into the tent and assures each one of them that he himself brought the wounded man to the tent with his own hands four the overzealous man overzealousness is an excess in saying or doing with good intentions of course the overzealous man is one who gets up in public and engages to do things which he cannot perform in cases where no doubt exists in the mind of any one else he raises some objection only to be refuted at a banquet he forces the servants to mix more wine than the guests can drink if he sees two men in a quarrel he strives to part them though he knows neither one leaving the main road he leads his friends upon a bypath and presently cannot find his way he accosts his commander and inquires when he is going to draw up the troops for battle and what orders he intends to issue for the day after to-morrow he goes and tells his father that his mother is already asleep in her chamber if the doctor gives instructions that no wine be given a patient he administers just a little on the plea that he wants to set the sufferer right and when a woman dies he has carved on the tombstone her husband's name and her father's and her mother's along with the woman's own name and her native place and adds worthy people all of them in court as he takes the oath he remarks to the bystanders well, i've done this many a time before five the tactless man tactlessness is the faculty of hitting a moment that is unpleasant to the persons concerned the tactless man is the sort of person who selects a man's busy hour to go and confer with him he serenades his sweetheart when she has a fever if an acquaintance has just lost bail money on a friend he hunts him up and asks him to be his surety after a verdict has been rendered he appears at the trial to give evidence at a wedding where he is a guest he declaims against womankind when a friend has just finished a long journey he invites him to go for a walk he has a faculty for fetching a higher bidder for an article after it has been sold and in a group of companions he gets up and explains from the beginning a story which the others have just heard and have completely understood he is anxious to give himself the trouble to do what nobody wants done and yet what nobody likes to decline when men are in the midst of religious offerings and are making outlay of money he goes to collect his interest if he happens to be standing by when a slave is flogged he tells the story of how he once flogged a slave who then went away and hanged himself if he is arbitrator in a dispute he sets both contestants by the ears just at the moment when they are ready to settle their differences when he wants to dance he takes a partner who is not yet merry the shameless man 
shamelessness may be defined as contempt for decency joined with meanness of purpose your shameless fellow is one who robs a man and then returns to borrow money of him he sacrifices a victim to the gods and instead of making his supper from it he salts the meat down and then gets a meal at the house of a friend he calls a servant and taking bread and meat from the table says in a voice that all can hear try that to be oats. when he goes to market he reminds the butcher of all the patronage he has given him and as he stands by the scales throws in an extra piece if he can or if not a soup bone if he secures these he rests content if he fails he snatches a piece of tripe from the bench and makes off with it laughing he buys theatre tickets for friends that are staying in town goes along with them to the performance but does not contribute his share of the expense and the next day you'll find him taking his children and their tutor too when anybody has found a bargain in any line he demands to have a share he goes to the neighbors and borrows barley or sometimes even bran and actually endeavors to make those who lend him these articles deliver them at his house a favorite trick of his is to march up to the tubs in a private bathhouse draw a bucket of warm water dash it over his head despite the loud protests of the attendant and then say as he leaves well, that's a good bath no thanks to you seven the newsmonger newsmaking is the concoction of false stories of what people say and do at the gossip's caprice the newsmonger is one who straightway strikes an attitude and assumes a smiling air when he meets a friend and asks where have you been what news how's the situation have you any fresh word about it and then going straight on he asks is there no later report well the current rumors are good and without letting his friend reply he keeps right on what you haven't heard a word about it then i think i have a feast of news for you he always has in readiness some unheard-of soldier or a slave belonging to one estius a piper or lycon an obscure contractor just back from the battlefield and it is from one of these that he has heard the tidings the authorities for his reports are of the sort that you can never get hold of such are the men he quotes when he tells how polyperchon and the king carried the day and cassander was taken prisoner if anybody asks do you believe this he replies why the story is nosed all about the city is constantly gaining ground and the whole population is of one mind everybody is agreed about the battle it must have been a regular death's feast he reads a proof of it too in the faces of men in authority for they all wear a changed look he says he overheard that a man had come from macedonia who knows the whole history of the battle and that he has been concealed now five days in a house with the authorities there is a convincing pathos in his voice you can imagine it as he tells his story and exclaims luckless cassander ill-starred hero lo the fickleness of fortune vain it was that he rose to power but what i say is strictly between ourselves then he trips off and repeats the story to every man in town eight the mean man meanness is undue sparing of expense the mean man is the sort of person who will go to a creditor's house and demand a halfpenny interest before the month is up at dinner he counts the glasses each guest drinks and amongst his fellow banqueters he pours the smallest offerings to artemis he counts up the price a friend pays for a cheap purchase exclaiming that it takes his last penny if a servant breaks a pot or plate he deducts its value from his rations if his wife has lost a three-farthing piece he turns the furniture beds and cupboards round and round and hunts between the boards of the floor when he has anything to sell he puts the price so high that the buyer gets no bargain he permits no one to take a fig from his garden or to cross his field or even pick up an olive or a date that has fallen to the ground he examines his boundary marks every day to see that they have not been touched and he is always ready in case of default to use the right of seizure and to collect compound interest when he gives a banquet to his townsmen he cuts the meat in small pieces and sets a portion before each guest 
he goes to market but buys nothing he forbids his wife to lend salt or a lamp wick or a pinch of cumin marjoram or meal a fillet or a sacrificial wafer observing that these trifles make a large sum in the course of a year in a word one may see that the mean man's money chest is mouldy from being unopened the key rusty his cloak too scant to reach his thigh that he uses a mean little oil jar has his hair cropped to the scalp he does not wear his boots until midday and charges the fuller to use plenty of earth on his coat to keep it from soon getting soiled again nine the stupid man stupidity one may define as sluggishness in what a man says or does the stupid man computes a sum sets down the total and then asks his neighbor how much does it all make when he is defendant in a suit and should go to court he forgets all about it and puts off to his farm when he goes to a play at the theatre he is the only spectator that is left behind on the benches asleep he gets up in the night to go out after he has gorged himself and is bitten by the neighbor's dog he takes a thing and puts it away but when he comes to look for it he cannot find it if the death of a friend is announced to him that he may go to the funeral with a sorrowful air and tears in his eyes he says oh thank god when he goes to receive payment of a debt he takes witnesses with him in the winter season he quarrels with his slave because cucumbers have not been provided he forces his children to wrestle and to run until they fall into a fever when he is roughing it in the country and himself cooks the vegetables he puts salt in the pot twice and so makes the dish impossible when it rains and others declare that the sky is darker than pitch he exclaims oh, how sweet it is to consider the stars and if he is asked what is the mortality of the city how many bodies have passed through the sacred gates he replies would that you and i had as many ten the surly man surliness is sullen rudeness of speech the surly man is one who when you ask him who is that gentleman retorts ah oh, don't bother me and when you greet him on the street refuses to return your salutation when he has anything for sale he will not tell the purchaser what he charges but instead inquires how much do i get for it when one would show him some attention and sends him a gift for the holidays he says he is not in need of presents he accepts no excuse when by accident you smutch his clothes or push against him in a crowd or chance to tread upon his foot if you ask for his contribution to some object he refuses to make one though afterwards he may bring it around declaring however that he's throwing the money away sometimes he stumbles in the street and then he curses the stone that tripped him up and he's not a man to tarry many minutes for a friend who has an appointment with him singing declamation and dancing are amusements for which he has no taste and it's exactly like him to refuse to join even in prayer to the gods. End of part one. Part two of The Characters of Theophrastus by Theophrastus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two. Eleven. The Superstitious Man superstition is a crouching fear of unseen powers the superstitious man is the sort of person who begins the day only after he has sprinkled himself washed his hands with holy water and taken a sprig of laurel in his mouth if a weasel cross his path he will not go a step further until some one else has crossed or until he has thrown three stones over the way if he sees a snake in his house he prays to sebasius provided it is a copperhead or if it be a sacred serpent he straightway builds a shrine upon the spot as he passes by the consecrated stones at the crossroads he pours oil on them from his flask falls on his knees and prays before he goes further if a mouse should gnaw through a leather flower-bag he goes to the seer and asks what he shall do 
if the seer bids him give the bag to the cobbler to be sewn up he pays no heed to him but goes his way and offers up the bag as a holy sacrifice he is given to purifying his house often by religious rites and insists it is haunted by hecate when he takes a walk and hears an owl hoot he is terrified and cries out athena thine is the power and so walks on he will not step on a grave nor go up to a corpse nor to a woman in confinement but says it is not well to risk pollution he orders his domestics to mull the wine on the fourth and seventh of the month while he goes out and buys myrtle incense and holy cakes on his return he spends the livelong day in crowning the images of hermaphroditus when he has had a vision he goes to the soothsayer the seer or the augur to ask to what god or goddess he must pray he goes to the orphic mysteries to be initiated into them you will be sure to find him amongst the people who frequent the beach to besprinkle themselves every month he goes there with his wife or if his wife is busy then with the nurse and children if he observes any one at the crossroads ground with garlic on his return he washes himself from head to foot summons a priestess and gives orders to celebrate rites of purification either with an onion or a small dog whenever he sees a madman or an epileptic he shakes with terror and spits in his bosom twelve the thankless man thanklessness is an improper criticism of what one receives the thankless man when a friend has sent him something from his table says to the servant who brings it he grudged me a dish of soup and a cup of wine i suppose and so wouldn't invite me to dinner when his sweetheart kisses him he says i wonder if you really do love me so in your heart he blames zeus not for raining but for not raining before when he picks up a purse in the street he says but i never found a treasure if he secures a slave at a bargain after long dickering with the owner he says i imagine i haven't got much at this price to the person who brings the glad tidings that a son is born to him he retorts if you only add and half your fortune's gone you'll hit it when he wins his case in court and secures a unanimous verdict he abuses his attorney for having omitted many points in his brief when his friends make him up a purse and wish him joy why so he exclaims is it because i shall have to pay you all back and be grateful into the bargain as though you had done me a favour thirteen the suspicious man suspicion is a kind of belief that everybody is fraudulent the suspicious man is the sort of person who sends a servant to market and then sends another to watch him and find out the price he pays when he carries the money himself he sits down every hundred yards and counts it over after he is in bed he asks his wife whether she locked the chest and shut the cupboard and whether the hall door bolt was pushed well in if she answers yes he gets up nevertheless and lights a lamp naked and barefoot he goes around and examines everything even then he finds it hard to go to sleep when he goes to collect interest he takes witnesses along lest his debtors deny the claims he has his cloak dyed not by the best workman but by the fuller who can furnish good security if any one asks the loan of a wine set he prefers not to lend it but if a member of his family or a near relative wants it he makes the loan yet he scarcely does so until he has had it assayed and weighed and has received a guarantee for its safe return he orders his footman not to fall behind him but to go in front so that by watching him he may prevent his running away if a purchaser has bought goods of him and says charge the amount to me i have no time now to send the money he replies do not trouble yourself about it when you have finished your business i will go with you and get my pay fourteen the disagreeable man disagreeableness we may define as a kind of conduct which is annoying although it may not be injurious the disagreeable man will go to a friend and wake him out of a sound sleep to have a talk with him he detains passengers who are on the point of embarking 
others who have come to see him he bids wait until he has taken his walk he takes the baby from its nurse chews its food for it and feeds it dandles it on his knee while he coos to it and calls it papa's little rascal at table he tells the company how he once took hellebore and was physicked through and through and how his bile was blacker than the soup on the table and he asks before the family i say mammy what a day was it when you were confined and i was born he says he has a cool cistern water at his home and a garden full of tender vegetables that his cook is a perfect chef and that his house is a regular hotel for it is always full of company and his guests are like leaky sieves do the best he can it is impossible to fill them when he gives a dinner he exhibits his jester and shows him off before the company to enliven his guests over their cups he says that further pleasures have been arranged for them fifteen the exquisite exquisiteness is a striving for honour in small things the exquisite when invited to dinner is eager to sit by his host when he cuts off his son's hair for an offering to the gods no place but delphi will answer for the ceremony his attendant must be an ethiopian when he pays a mina of money he makes a point of offering a freshly minted piece if he has a pet daw in the house he must needs buy it a ladder and a brazen shield that the daw may learn to climb the ladder carrying the shield when he has sacrificed an ox he winds the head and horns with fillets and nails them up opposite the entrance in order that those who come in may see what he has been doing when he parades with the cavalry he gives all his accoutrements to his squire to carry home and throwing back his mantle stalks proudly about the market-place in his spurs when his pet dog dies he raises a monument to the creature and has a pillar erected with the inscription fido pure maltese in the asclepion he dedicates a brazen finger polishes it crowns it with flowers and anoints it every day with oil and he has his hair cut frequently his teeth are always pearly white while his old suit is still good he gets himself a new one and he anoints himself with the choicest perfumes in the agora he frequents the banker's counters if he visits the gymnasia he selects those in which the ephebe practice and when there's a play the place he chooses in the theatre is close beside the generals he makes few purchases for himself but sends presents to his friends at Byzantium and Spartan dogs to Sisychus and Hymetian honey to Rhodes, and when he does these things he tells it about the town. Naturally his taste runs to pet monkeys, parrots, Sicilian doves, gazelles' knuckle-bones, thurian jars, crooked canes from Sparta, hangings inwrought with Persian figures, a wrestling ring sprinkled with sand, and a tennis court he goes around and offers this arena to philosophers sophists fighters and musicians for their exhibitions and at the performances he himself comes in last of all that the spectators may say to one another that's the gentleman to whom the place belongs and of course when he is prytanus he demands of his colleagues the privilege of announcing to the people the result of the sacrifice then putting on a fine garment and a garland of flowers he advances and says o oh, men of athens we pretanes have made sacrifice to the mother of the gods the sacrifice is fair and good receive ye each your portion when he has made this announcement he returns home and tells his wife all about it in an ecstasy of joy sixteen the garrulous man garrulity is incessant heedless talk your garrulous man is one for instance who sits down beside a stranger and after recounting the virtues of his wife tells the dream he had last night and everything he ate for supper then if his efforts seem to meet with favour he goes on to declare that the present age is sadly degenerate says wheat is selling very low that hosts of strangers are in town and that since the dionysia the weather is good again for shipping 
and that if zeus would only send more rain the crops would be much heavier and that he's proposing to have a farm himself next year and that life's a constant struggle and that at the mysteries demippus set up an enormous torch and tells how many columns the odeon has and yesterday says he i had an awful turn with my stomach and what days to-day and in bedromian come the mysteries and in panopsium the apaturia and in poseidon the country dionysia and so on for unless you refuse to listen he never stops seventeen the boar we may define a boar as a man who cannot refrain from talking a boar is the sort of fellow who the moment you open your mouth tells you that your remarks are idle that he knows all about it and if you'll only listen you'll soon find it out as you attempt to make answer he suddenly breaks in with such interruptions as uh, don't forget what you were about to say that reminds me what an admirable thing talk is but as i omitted to a mention you grasp the idea at once i was watching this long time to see whether you would come to the same conclusion as myself in phrases like this he's so fertile that the person who happens to meet him cannot even open his mouth to speak when he has vanquished a few stray victims here and there his next move is to advance upon whole companies and put them to flight in the midst of their occupations he goes into the wrestling ground or into the schools and prevents the boys from making progress with their lessons so incessant is his talk with the teachers and the wrestling masters if you say you are going home he's pretty sure to come along and escort you to your house whenever he learns the day set for the session of the assembly he noises it diligently abroad and recalls demosthenes famous bout with asinus in the archonship of aristophon he mentions too his own humble effort on a certain occasion and the approval which it won among the people as he rattles on he launches invectives against the masses in such fashion that his audience either becomes oblivious or begins to doze or else melts away in the midst of his harangue when he's on a jury he's an obstacle to reaching a verdict when he's in the theatre he prevents attention to the play at a feast he hinders eating remarking that silence is too much of an effort that his tongue is hung in the middle and that he couldn't keep still even though he should seem a worse chatterer than a magpie and when he's made a butt by his own children he submits when in their desire to go to sleep they say papa tell us something in order that sleep may come eighteen the rough roughness is coarse conduct whether in word or act the rough takes an oath lightly and is insensible to insult and ready to give it in character he is a sort of town bully obscene in manner ready for anything and everything he is willing sober and without a mask to dance the vulgar cordax in comic chorus at a show he goes around from man to man and collects the pennies quarrelling with the spectators who present a pass and therefore insist on seeing the performance free he is the sort of man to keep a hostelry or brothel or to farm the taxes there is no business he considers beneath him but he is ready to follow the trade of crier cook or gambler he does not support his mother is caught at theft and spends more time in jail than in his home he is the type of man who collects a crowd of bystanders and harangues them in a loud brawling voice while he is talking some are going and others coming without listening to him to one part of the moving crowd he tells the beginning of his story to another part a sketch of it and to another part a mere fragment he regards a holiday as the fittest time for the full exhibition of his roughness he is a great figure in the courts as a plaintiff or defendant sometimes he excuses himself on oath from the trial but later he appears with a bundle of papers in the breast of his cloak and a file of documents in his hands he enjoys the role of generalissimo in a band of rowdy loafers he lends his followers money and on every shilling collects a penny interest per day he visits the bake shops the markets for fresh and pickled fish collects his tribute from them and stuffs it in his cheek nineteen the affable man 
affability is a sort of demeanor that gives pleasure at the sacrifice of what is best the affable man is the kind of person who hails a friend at a distance and after he has told him what a fine fellow he is and has lavished brimming admiration on him seizes both his hands and is unwilling to let him go he escorts the friend a step on his way and as he asks when shall we meet again tears himself away with praises still falling from his lips when summoned to court he wishes to please not merely the man in whose interest he appears but his adversary too that he may seem to be non-partisan and of strangers he says that they pronounce juster judgment than his townsmen if he is invited out to dinner he asks his host to call in the children and when they come he declares they are as like their father as one fig is like another and he draws them toward him kisses them and sets them by his side sometimes he joins in their sports shouting strike and foul and sometimes he lets them go to sleep in his lap in spite of the burden twenty the impudent man impudence is easy to define it is conduct that is obtrusively offensive the impudent man is one who on meeting respectable women in the street insults them as he passes at a play he claps his hand after all the rest have stopped and hisses the players when others wish to watch in silence when the theatre is still he suddenly stands up and disgorges to make the audience look around when the marketplace is crowded he steps up to the stalls where nuts myrtleberries or fruits are for sale and begins to pick at them as he talks to the merchant he calls by name people whom he doesn't know and stops those intent upon some errand when a man has just lost an important case and is now leaving the court he runs up and tenders his congratulations he buys his own provisions too and hires his own musicians showing his purchases to every man he meets and inviting him to come and share the feast again he takes his stand before a barber's booth or a perfumer's stall and proclaims unblushingly his intention of getting drunk End of part two. Part three of the characters of Theophrastus by Theophrastus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three. Twenty one. The gross man. Grossness is such neglect of one's person as gives offence to others. The gross man is one who goes about with an eczema or white eruption or diseased nails and says that these are congenital ailments for his father had them and his grandfather too and it would be hard to foist an outsider upon their family he's very apt to have sores on his shins and bruises on his toes and to neglect these things so that they grow worse his armpits are hairy like an animal's for a long distance down his sides his teeth are black and decayed as he eats he blows his nose with his fingers as he talks he drools and has no sooner drunk wine than up it comes after bathing he uses rancid oil to anoint himself and when he goes to the market-place he wears a thick tunic and a thin outer garment disfigured with spots of dirt when his mother goes to consult the soothsayer he utters words of evil omen and when people pray and offer sacrifices to the gods he lets the goblet fall laughing as though he had done something amusing when there's playing on the flute he alone of the company claps his hands singing an accompaniment and upbraiding the musician for stopping so soon often he tries to spit across the table only to miss the mark and hit the butler twenty two the boor boorishness is ignorance of good form the boor is the sort of man who takes a strong drink and then goes to the assembly he insists that myrrh has not a whit sweeter smell than onions his boots are too big for his feet and he talks in a loud voice he distrusts even friends and kinsmen while his most important secrets are shared with his domestics and he tells all the news of the assembly to his farm hands nothing awakens his admiration or startles him on the streets so much as the sight of an ox an ass or a goat and then he stands agape in contemplation 
he is the sort of man who snatches a bite from the pantry and drinks his liquor straight he has clandestine talks with the cook and helps her grind the meal for his household at breakfast he throws bits to the animals about the table he answers the knock at the door himself and then whistles for his dog takes him by the nose and says here's the keeper of my house and grounds when a man offers him a coin he declines it saying it is too worn and takes another piece in its stead after loaning a plough basket sickle or sack he goes after it unable to sleep for thinking of it when he goes to town he inquires of any chance passer-by what are hides selling for what's the price of bacon does the celebration of new moon come to-day then he remarks he must go down the street and have his hair cut and while in town must also run into the shop of archias and buy the bacon he sings in the public baths and wears hobnailed boots twenty three the penurious man penuriousness is the grudging of expense and is due to great love of money and little love of honour the penurious man after a victory on the tragic stage sets up a wooden chaplet to dionysius on which he inscribes his own name if contributions from the public are asked for he is silent or rises and quits the company when he gives his daughter in marriage he sells the sacrificial offerings excepting the parts that belong by law to the priests at the wedding he employs only servants who will eat at home as trierarch he takes the pilot's blankets and spreads them on deck for himself while he puts his own away he is the sort of man who keeps his children from school when a festival comes and makes excuses for them on the plea of ill health that he may avoid the fee for tuition when he goes to market he brings the meat home with him carrying the vegetables in the folds of his cloak he stays indoors when he sends his tunic to the cleaner if he catches sight of a friend coming towards him and soliciting contribution he sneaks off through a by-street and goes home by a roundabout way he employs no maid for his wife although she brought him a dowry but hires a child from the woman's market to accompany her on her errands he keeps his patched shoes until they are twice worn out saying they are still good and tough as horn when he gets up he dusts the house and makes the beds and when he sits down he lays aside the coat he is wearing in order to spare it twenty four the pompous man pompousness is contempt for everybody save oneself if you have urgent business the pompous man will tell you that he will meet you after dinner on his walk if he has done you a favour he reminds you of it when elected to office he declines saying under oath he has no leisure he is not disposed to make the first call on anybody tradesmen and hired men he orders to come to him by daybreak as he passes along the street he does not greet the men he meets he lowers his eyes and when it suits him raises them again if he entertains friends he does not dine with them but instructs some of his underlings to attend to the duties of entertainment he sends a messenger ahead when he makes a call to say that he approaches he allows no one to enter while he is at his oil rub his bath or his dinner when he is casting an account he instructs a slave to set down the items foot up the total and arrange it in a statement for him he does not write in a letter you would do me a favour but i want this done and i have sent for this and wish to have it and see to it that my orders are followed precisely and have this done immediately twenty five the braggart bragging is pretending to have excellences that one does not really possess the braggart is the man who stands on the wharf and tells the bystanders how much capital he has invested in ships at sea and tells how extensive is his business of loaning money and how much he has made and lost by different ventures as he talks thus magnificently he sends his slave to his banker where he has uh, exactly one shilling to his credit on a journey he imposes on his travelling companion by telling him that he once served with alexander and how intimate were their relations and how many jewelled cups he brought back from his campaigns 
as regards the asiatic artists he counts them better than those in europe and all this he tells you without having once set foot outside his native city he claims further to have three letters from antipater bidding him come to macedonia but he declares that though he has been guaranteed the privilege of exporting wood free of duty he has refused to go simply to avoid being suspected by his fellow citizens of foreign leanings the macedonians he says in urging him so to come ought to have considered this point in time of famine he says his expenditures for the poor amounted to over five talents for he hadn't the heart to refuse when he's with strangers he often bids someone place the reckoning counters on the table and computing by six hundreds and by mine glibly mentioning the names of his pretended debtors he makes a total of twenty-four talents saying that the whole sum had gone for voluntary contributions and that too without including subscriptions for the navy or for other public objects at times he goes to the horse market where blooded stock is for sale and makes pretense of wanting to buy and stepping up to the block he hunts his clothes for two talents upbraiding his servant for coming along without any money though he lives in a rented house he represents it to those who do not know as the family homestead yet adds that he thinks of selling it as being too small for the proper entertainment of his friends twenty six the oligarch oligarchy is a love of power that clings tightly to personal advantage the oligarch rises in the people's councils when assistants to the archon are elected for the management of a fete and says these men must have absolute control and although others have suggested ten he insists that one is enough but he must be a man the only line of homer that stays in his memory is a crowd's rule is bad let there be one ruler he knows no other verse he is however an adept at such phrases as this we must hold a caucus and make our plans we must cut loose from mob and market we must throw aside the annoyance of petty office and of insult or honour at the masses whim we or they must rule the state at midday he goes out with his mantle thrown about him his hair dressed in the mode and his nails fashionably trimmed he promenades down odeon way ejaculating sycophants have made the city no longer habitable what outrages we endure in court from our persecutors why men nowadays go into office is a marvel to me how ungrateful the mob is although one is always giving giving if at the assembly a naked hungry vagabond sits next to him he complains of the outrage when he asks is a stop to be put to this ruin of our property by taxation for fetes and navy how odious is this crew of demagogues theseus he says was the forefront of all this offending for out of twelve cities he brought the masses into one to overthrow the monarchies he met his just reward he was the first to fall a victim at their hands this is the way he talks to foreigners and to citizens of his own temper and party twenty seven the backbiter backbiting is a disposition to vilify others when the backbiter is asked who is so and so he begins like the genealogist with the man's ancestry his father's name was originally Sosius, but amongst the soldiers it became Sosostratus, and upon registration in the dim it was again changed to Sosodemus. His mother was a Thracian, gentle blood, you see. At any rate, this jewel's name was Crinococcora. Women of that name are of gentle blood in Thrace, so people say. The man himself, with an ancestry like that, is a foul fellow fit for the whipping post in a company where his companions are maligning a man he of course takes up the attack and says for my part i hate him of all men he is a bad character as one may see from his face and as for his meanness it has no parallel and here's a proof his wife brought him a dowry of talents of money and yet after the birth of their first child he gave her but three pence a day for household expenses and forced her to bathe in cold water on the festival of poseidon in midwinter 
when he is seated with a group he loves to talk about an acquaintance who has just risen and gone and his biting tongue does not spare even the man's kinsfolk of his own relatives and friends he says the vilest things and even maligns the dead backbiting is what he calls frankness of speech democracy and freedom and there is nothing he enjoys so much twenty eight the avaricious man avarice is greedy love of gain when the avaricious man gives a dinner he puts scant allowance of bread on the table he borrows money of a stranger who is lodging with him when he distributes the portions at table he says it is fair for the laborer to receive double and straightway loads his own plate he engages in wine traffic and sells adulterated liquors even to his friend he goes to the show and takes his children with him on the days when spectators are admitted to the galleries free when he is the people's delegate he leaves at home the money provided by the city and borrows from his fellow commissioners he loads more luggage on his porter than the man can carry and provides him with the smallest rations of any man in the party when presents are given the delegates by foreign courts he demands his share at once and sells it at the bath he says the oil brought him is bad and shouts boy the oil is rancid and in its stead takes what belongs to another if his servants find money on the highway he demands a share of it saying lux gifts are common property when he sends his cloak to be clean he borrows another from an acquaintance and keeps it until it is asked for he also does this sort of thing he uses king frugal's measure with the bottom dented in for doling out supplies to his household and then secretly brushes off the top he sells underweight even to his friend who thinks he is buying according to market standard when he pays a debt of thirty pounds he does so with a discount of four shillings when owing to sickness his children are not at school the entire month he deducts a proportionate amount from the teacher's pay and during the month of antisarian he does not send them to their studies at all on account of the frequent shows and so he avoids tuition fees if he receives coppers from a slave who has been serving out he demands in addition the exchange value of silver when he gets a statement from the deem's administrator he demands provision for his slaves at public cost he makes note of the half radishes left on the table to keep the servants from taking them if he goes abroad with friends he uses their servants and hires his own out yet he does not contribute to the common fund the money thus received when others combine with him to give a banquet at his house he secretly includes in his account the wood figs vinegar salt and lamp oil trifles furnished from his supplies if a marriage is announced in a friend's family he goes away a little beforehand to avoid sending a wedding present he borrows of friends such articles as they would not ask to have returned or such as if returned they would not readily accept 29. The Late Learner The late learner has a fondness for study late in life. He commits whole passages of poetry to memory when sixty years of age, but when he essays to quote them at a banquet, his memory trips. From his son he learns a forward march, shoulder arms, bout face. At the Feast of Heroes he pits himself against the boys in the torch race, and, of course, when he is invited to the Temple of Hercules, he throws aside his mantle and makes ready to lift the steer that he may bend back its neck. He goes to the wrestling ground and joins in the matches. At the shows he stays one performance after another until he has learned the songs by heart. If he is dedicated to Sabasius, he is eager to be declared the fairest if he falls in love with some damsel he makes an onset on her door only to be assaulted by a rival and hauled before the court he makes a trip to the country on a mare he has never before ridden and essaying feats of horsemanship on the road he falls and breaks his head he joins a boys club too and entertains the members at his house he plays ducks and drakes with his servant and competes at archery and javelin throwing with his children's tutor and he expects the tutor as though ignorant of these sports to learn them from him 
he wrestles at the baths turning a bench nimbly about to create the impression that he has been well trained in the art and if women happen to be standing near he trips a dance whistling his own music thirty the vicious man viciousness is love of what is bad the vicious man is one who associates with men convicted in public suits and who assumes that if he makes friends of these fellows he will gain in knowledge of the world and so will be more feared of upright men he declares that no one is by nature upright but that all men are alike and he even reproaches the man who is honourable the bad man he asserts is free from prejudice if one will but make the trial and while in some respects he admits that men speak truly of such a man in others he refuses to allow it for says he the fellow is clever companionable and a gentleman in fact he maintains that he never met so talented a person he supports him therefore when he speaks in the assembly or is defendant in court and to those sitting in judgment he's apt to say that one must judge not the man but the facts and he declares that his friend is the very watchdog of the people for he watches out for evildoers and he adds we shall no longer have men to burden themselves with a care for the common weal if we abandon men like him it's the vicious man's way to constitute himself the patron of all worthless scamps and to support them before the court in desperate cases and when he passes judgment he puts the worst construction on the arguments of the opposing counsel end of part three end of the characters of theophrastus by theophrastus